much for the introduction and uh, thanks indeed for inviting me here to this uh, fantastic meeting in Argentina. It has been great to be here with all the great science, with all the hospitality, so I'm really gracious uh, that I can be here. What I'd like to do in uh, my talk today is uh, to tell you a little bit about our work uh, back in Munich. It's actually Munich, Martin Street. Um, and uh, to tell you uh, what we've learned about the question of how experience uh, changes uh, synapses in the mammalian brain. And the basis of um, that, um, that question is, of course, the assumption that's widely held in the field that the way that we store information in the brain is actually by changing connections in the brain, by changing synapses, the connection between, between <laughs> neurons. And um, what we want to find out is whether we can, first of all, measure when we learn something, how those synapses change, but then uh, in the next step, quite literally, whether we can see those changes, whether they are structural um, and anatomical changes in the brain that we can see when a brain stores information. So this is the basic question that we're after in, in my lab uh, back in Munich in Germany. And um, with the word experience in, in my title, I should say that at the outset, I actually mean, mean two, uh, two kinds of experiences. One is experience as we, or, or animals, get it early in life uh, when an animal, uh, for instance, learns to see it, when the visual system develops under the influence uh, of experience in the outside world. So it, it, you could call it early learning. And the other kind of experience is uh, more learning in the adult, the experience, uh, the, the information that is stored in my brain, for instance, when I experience uh, this new environment, new environment here in Buenos Aires, when one uh, gets to know new people, when one learns phone numbers, all, all those kinds of things. So this is experience in the sense of adult learning much more the way that we uh, normally think about learning. And um, I will, uh, in just a moment, uh, tell you about the, the ways that we address those questions in my laboratory, but before doing so, what I wanted to do is to show you a little movie clip, which is actually not from our work, but it's uh, from uh, some guy in Germany who uh, likes uh, training mice, and I want to impress on you how smart uh, an animal, a mouse, actually can be, and how complicated uh, things uh, can be learned also by those uh, uh, seemingly simple animals. So just, just watch that for a moment. This mouse has been trained to run through this obstacle course here. As you will see, it's quite complicated. It's uh, important to note that um, there are no olfactory cues. The mouse has been taught that by a procedure which is called click learning. I can tell you later how, how that works. And it's quite amazing if you look at all the things uh, that the mouse recalls there. And when I first saw this movie, as I said, it does amazing things. When I first saw this movie, I couldn't help but think, wouldn't it be fantastic if one could look into this mouse's brain and see what happens, quite literally, with a microscope, see what happens when an animal learns those things and later when it recalls it. Now, uh, this uh, may sound a little bit uh, like, uh, like science fiction to you, um, but I'll show you towards the end of the talk that actually it's not so much science fiction anymore and that we can get quite close to uh, looking at things like that. So having uh, said that, um, let, me, let me start uh, with the talk proper, so to speak, and speak about how we currently think about how learning is achieved in the brain. One very important figure, and I actually don't know, I hope you can, you can read this on the screens, but one very important figure was this uh, gentleman here, Donald Hebb, who some, a little bit more than 60 years ago now, proposed uh, on purely theoretical terms uh, at, uh, the, uh, at this time, who was a psychologist who was thinking about brain function, who was thinking about how uh, memories could be stored. He had an idea which he put forward in a book which was called The Organization of Behavior, and the idea is actually quite simple. What he assumed, uh, or what he proposed, was if there were a mechanism in the brain that synapses would always be enhanced when the pre- and the post-synaptic neuron, in other words, the two neurons that are connected by the synapse, if they are active together, if the intervening synapse would be strengthened, that would be an ideal mechanism to explain basically all the brain, uh, all the memory mechanisms or all the memory effects uh, that one knows. It would explain associativity, it would explain fault tolerance, all those things. I don't want to go into the details now, but it's actually relatively easy to explain how with such a simple rule one can really explain a lot of the things that were known about human memory or animal mem memory as well. Now, as I said, this was um, a, a theoretical idea and it took uh, 
40 years or so until it was actually shown by, by a Swedish group that yes, indeed, in the brain, and in fact in the brain structure, which is important for memory, namely the hippocampus, indeed those synapses exist. You stimulate the pre- and the postsynaptic neuron and the intervening synapses are being strengthened. It took even longer to um, try to go after something that also people had tried to prove immediately, but it turned out to be very difficult, namely the question, what happens? How is this done? And uh, as you can see, uh, he proposed here that there should be some growth process, or you can also call it a structural change, which uh, should actually implement those changes. And people were after that, used electron microscopy, etc., to see those. It turned out to be incredibly difficult mainly for the reason because the right technologies were missing. One needed a technology where you can look at synapses in living tissue with the required resolution in space and time. And then, a bit more than 10 years ago, in, uh, um, in 1999, which was uh, early days of two-photon microscopy, but two-photon microscopy came along, and it made it possible for two groups. One of them is, is us down here. I assume you can't read that here. Another group is, uh, was the group from Karel Svoboda, who was at Cold Spring Harbor Labs at the time, could show in parallel, completely independently, that yes, indeed, you can show in brain tissue that if you enhance synapses, structural changes occur, and those structural changes occur on the level of uh, those, little, um, those little structures here, which are called dendritic spines, which you'll see a little bit better in the next picture here, which is then from our own data. This is a, a, a part of a neuron. This is the dendrite, the input bit of a neuron, or a tiny bit of that, so the cell body would be somewhere up here. And what we then did is that we enhanced synapses there, looked with the two-photon mo microscope in the region where we knew that this enhancement had to happen, and looked for uh, morphological changes. And I'll just let this movie run. And you can observe with me down here, this is when we had the enhancement. And if you look up here, for instance, you'll see how one new structure, the so-called dendritic spine, emerges. Let's look at the same thing again. We'll zoom in in a moment, and again, you can see up here how uh, such a new structure emerges. So that was exciting at the time because it was the first time, so to speak, that you could see what happens in the brain when information is stored, or at least what we thought would happen uh, when information was stored. And this was then the basis of all our um, work after that, trying to see whether we can explain that better, and then also whether we can see similar things in the intact, uh, in intact tissue. And um, since time is limited today, I chose to just briefly, in a couple of words, tell you about uh, many of the things that we're doing in the lab and then concentrate actually on one story which I want to explain to you because I think it's an important, pro uh, uh, an important step forward that we've made recently. So basically the way that we work in my laboratory is that we take two approaches. One is to study from a cellular or a subcellular point of view what happens when one observes those things. So what are the uh, cellular mechanisms, what are the molecular mechanisms. So we, for instance, looked whether we can, with learning, not only produce those new spines, but whether uh, an electrical stimulus which causes forgetting also leads to abolishment of those spines. And yes, it does. And then we looked, if we have those structures that are emerging there, how long does it take for such a structure to turn into a functional synapse? It, uh, took surprisingly long. It took almost a day, which surprised us and, and uh, many people in the field quite a bit. And we took super resolution uh, microscopy techniques to look further into what exactly happens. All those things I'll omit today, but I just wanted to briefly mention that this is uh, at least uh, occupies at least half of my lab to really study from a cellular and subcellular point of view the mechanisms of what happens when new spines are being formed, which we think is the basis of information storage. Then the other um, aspect of our work that I would like to talk about today is um, at least as important, I would say, or let's say equally important, because it takes what we observe here in cellular assays into the intact brain, and it lets us ask the question, it's an important part, so I wanted that you hear it. Um, 
it lets us ask the question uh, whether we see those, uh, those phenom phenomena also in the intact brain, and more importantly, whether they are really important for the storage of memory in the intact brain. And in order to do that, we go to the visual cortex, and I just briefly need to remind you how the visual cortex of a, of a mouse works and how, what its anatomy is. So this here is a, schematically a top view of the mouse brain. You may remember that the mouse has a contralaterally dominated visual system, which means that this eye is represent, or let's put it the other way around, that here back in the visual cortex, there's more of uh, information represented from the contralateral side than from the ipsilateral side, hence a bigger blue line here and a weaker uh, red line. But both come together and one has here, again, it may be hard for you to read, a monocular zone and a binocular zone. Now, if we talk about the binocular zone for a moment, oh, I'm getting lots of trains here. Um, what one can do is that, w that one can look at how it, is, how it is influenced by inputs from the two eyes and how that relates to experience. And those are very famous experiments from uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, um, also um, almost 50 years ago. And uh, what's um, common knowledge and, uh, is basically that in the normal case, as I just explained, you have more contralateral input than ipsilateral input. Now, if you close one eye for a couple of days, which is called monocular deprivation, what happens is that this here actually changes that some of the contralateral inputs go away and additional inputs from the ipsilateral eye are being generated. And then if you open this eye again, everything goes back to normal. If and only if, and that's important, if that happens in the critical period, which is a couple of weeks in the beginning of an animal's life when the brain is still particularly plastic. And all of that can be measured, and I don't want to go into the details here how to measure that, but basically you look here, uh, this has contra-ipsy ratio, so you look how strongly the cortex here is influenced by stimulating the contralateral eye and the, the ipsilateral eye, and then you build a ratio, and that's above two, which means there's more contra than ipsilateral input. If you close one eye, um, after a couple of days, this drops, which means that uh, this relationship is turned around like that, and every, everything goes back to normal. So this is the basic, this is textbook knowledge, but you need to know it to uh, understand what uh, I'll be talking about. And now let me tell you in a couple of words what I want to get at, the, the memory paradigm, so, uh, so to speak, that I want to uh, um, look uh, at w uh, together with you. It's something that uh, you may not know by name, it's called savings, uh, because, uh, but you certainly do know it because you know it from everyday experience. What savings means uh, is the experience or the, the, uh, what we all know that if you have learned something early in life, it's much easier to relearn the same thing again later in life. That you can take the example of, for instance, skiing. If you le have learned to ski as a kid, even if you don't do it for 30 years, it'll take you a couple of hours and you're up to speed again, um, even if you do it with 40 or 50, whereas if you've never learned it, it's very difficult to do that as an adult. Or you can do bike riding or you can do language. It's, it's, it's very common knowledge and you all uh, know it. And it's called savings because you you, the second time around, you save energy, time, whatever, and that's uh, hence the name savings. So what I want to do is to try to emulate that in the visual system and then look at the, 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 the reasons why we have savings, in that case, in the mouse brain. So here is uh, the experiment that we want to do. Again, I hope you can read it, but let's first look at the, the upper line here, which is the control experiment where we take an animal, we bring it through the critical period, do nothing, and only then later in the adult, we deprive one eye of vision for three days. And this is what happens in the same way that I displayed it earlier, this contra-ipsy ratio. Basically, nothing happens, and this is uh, expected because you're beyond the critical period here, you're beyond the time when the cortex uh, is uh, uh, still plastic. Down here comes the savings experiment. You take an animal, you deprive it during the critical period for a couple of days of vision. What happens, and I'm not showing it, but uh, you'll get this drop here, then you have full recovery, and uh, the recovery is shown over here. And then you do exactly what you did to the other animal before. The only difference being that this animal has had this prior experience. It has l learned what that means during the phase when the brain was still plastic. And what you see, lo and behold, is that yes, indeed, all of a sudden, this monocular deprivation, which didn't have any effect in the control because there was no prior experience, all of a sudden has, has an effect. 
So this is precisely savings, but in an animal paradigm in the visual cortex, so that we can now study what are the cellular reasons for, for uh, the savings paradigm. So let's think for a moment uh, about ways um, how that could be explained in principle. There, there are two ways. You can think um, that one way or one reason why this happens is you close one eye, the animal experiences this plasticity phase during, uh, uh, during the critical period, and that somehow makes the whole brain, the whole visual brain more plastic, so that whatever happens later, uh, you would have a, a bigger effect. Or you could think in another way, so that would be a more global effect, or you can think in another way that what happens here very specifically somehow leaves a trace, whatever this trace may be uh, exactly, in the visual brain, so that those things, those traces can later be reutilized and therefore the second time around you see, um, you see a stronger change. And an easy way to test that is to do the same experiment only instead of closing one eye and testing the same eye later, you close one eye and test the other eye. If it's a more global effect, you should see the same thing. If it's a different, uh, if it's a specific effect, you should not see anything. And that's what we did here. We closed the contralateral eye and later tested the ipsilateral eye. And lo and behold, you don't see any effect, which then argues that it's not a global making the brain more plastic, but it's something very specific. It matters what you've learned earlier. In other words, if you've learned, for instance, skiing, you won't be better in bike riding or the other way around. It's, it's more specific uh, uh, than just a, a, motor, a motor skill that you learn. So, and then the question for us was, could we go into, in, into this brain and um, see what is really, what are the reasons for, for the savings paradigm? And there we used again this two photon microscopy that I described very briefly earlier or that I mentioned briefly earlier, only in this case in an in intact animal, we looked into the brain and wanted to see in the brain, can we see what happens uh, during those, uh, during those uh, procedures? So this here just shows you schematically, this is a schematic uh, side view of uh, how one uh, does that. One has a live animal, one uh, produces a window so that you can look into the brain with a two-photon microscope. There's this glass cover slip here. It's uh, stabilized the brain with agar. You have a couple of neurons down here uh, which are fluorescing by uh, genetical tricks. I'm not going to go into that. You fix the whole thing with dental cement, and this is what it looks like in reality. So you see how one has this window on the mouse's brain. You can take this mouse, uh, image it, put it back into the cage, image a couple of days later, which is very important for our, um, for our experiments. And down here, you see the picture. You're looking onto the brain. Of course, you don't see the fluorescent uh, neurons as, as of yet, because uh, this is just the, um, the normal uh, bright field microscope. And if we uh, look here, this is what the neurons would look like. Of course, this is now a side view. Normally, you would look from above more as you see it uh, down here. This is a side view only to give the three-dimensional impression of the neurons. But this is what you really see, a bird's eye view of the neurons. And if you enlarge, for instance, this bit here, you see this. And this is all in the living brain. And you see, again, those uh, dendritic spines here. And the question is now, if we look at those dendritic spines, while we do this learning and relearning paradigm, can we see what happens there and can we make any sense of it? So here is the whole experiment. We would uh, initially implant a chamber and this is what it would look like. Then we would do functional imaging. I can't go into the details here, but basically this would tell us this is the visual cortex. So this is where we should look. And then we did our two photon microscope microscopy and looked in this bit here where we know that we look and look at the single cells and their spines and see how they change. And that we would do every four days. I'm sure you can't re 